I'm John Wilson. I'm uh, director of the Spatial Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California. And uh, you don't really want to listen to me. The, the, the best people to listen to today are Tom Fisher and his team uh, from the University of Minnesota, uh, Anna Clara and the team from uh, uh, Federal University of uh, here in um, Brazil. And uh, 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 Tiago uh, Barreto de Adrati, Costa and, and colleagues from the Federal University of Para in Brazil. And so we're going to watch three videos. And uh, if you have questions or comments, uh, we'd ask the audience to put those in the chat. And we're not speaking if the, if the speaker, if the presenters in the videos could uh, be monitoring that. Uh, we'll run through the three videos and then we'll have a conversation uh, around the questions and the presenters' answers. Thank you. The Science Center at the University of Minnesota has worked with a community organization, Lulu Partners, and the design and development community and several government agencies to reimagine the future of the Loop District, a industrial area that we think can serve as a model for the reuse of underutilized urban industrial parks in cities across the world. The Loop District is uh, a 100 acre uh, area next to downtown Minneapolis that houses the uh, city's farmer's market as well as um, it will be soon receiving uh, a light rail station, all of which will increase land values and development pressures. And we think the district offers an opportunity for the city to showcase a more equitable, affordable, and sustainable approach to urban development in an area where the city already owns over 30% of the land where there are currently no permanent residents. Our study incorporates the goals of the city's recently approved uh, comprehensive plan, Minneapolis 2040, which include eliminating disparities, increasing economic opportunity, responding to climate change, and respecting the city's diversity. Uh, this study also aligns with the sustainable development goals as well as the carbon sequestration goals of the Trillium Trees Project. The Root District has, uh, in addition to uh, the new light rail station, uh, highways on both its uh, western and southern borders. It also has a relatively new professional baseball stadium and a major energy recovery plant along its northeastern edge. Currently, the site is mostly paved and largely devoid of trees. And the current land use is mainly that of low-rise industrial buildings. Uh, it has the open air farmer's market adjacent to an elevated highway. And it also includes some of the city's public works facilities, a regional bike path, and two shelters, one for individuals and another for families experiencing homelessness. In our study, the early adopter scenario calls for by 2035, the district becoming an incubator for startup businesses in need of maker space and low cost short term retail space. There's a variety of mixed use and mixed income housing and uh, there would be a central green space connecting the farmer's market to the transit stop. In terms of the sustainable development goals, uh, those would help address food insecurity and economic opportunity for underserved communities as well as renewable energy to address climate change. In this early adopter scenario, by 2050, uh, the, the district would be built out with mid and high rise and also mixed income housing on either side of a central market and green space that would extend from the uh, transit station uh, to a residential neighborhood to the west and to the stadium to the east. The streets at the core of the district would become tree shaded pedestrian areas and because of the prevalence of autonomous vehicles, the highway would be eventually replaced with an urban agriculture corridor. This scenario addresses a number of sustainable development goals, reducing poverty, improving health, and increasing economic opportunity, as well as increased carbon sequestration as the district becomes a tree shaded oasis in the center of the city with a dense tree canopy as well as a mecca for people looking for economic opportunities. The early adopter scenario calls for planting 2,000 trees by 2035 and another 250 by 2050, which would sequester over 
22,000 kilograms of carbon annually. The late adopter scenario includes some of the district's industrial activities, would also include some more medium and high density housing. Uh, although this would not achieve many of the sustainable development goals. More high density development would occur by 2050 with a winner of crossing a central green space. And by 2050, that new development would uh, reduce inequality and expand sustainability efforts, especially related to urban agriculture and renewable energy. In this scenario, the district would have a modest amount of new green space with its tree canopy mostly lighting the streets and along the transit way. The late adopter scenario uh, calls for the planting of about a thousand trees by 2035 and another 30 by 2050. In the non-adopter scenario, uh, by 2050, the entire district would have been filled with high-end, high-rise, mixed-use housing. This high-end development would bring only modest improvements to the sustainable development goals. And uh, with its high density, there would be relatively little opportunity for tree planting. There would be uh, only about 400 trees planted by 2035, and another 80 by 2050. Our recommended plan is really the late adopter, the early adopter scenario, I mean, which would provide a lot of low cost startup economic opportunities for people, giving them access to equipment and opportunities that they would not normally have. Uh, and this is a, a shot showing the mural board that we use in our workshops and a list of all of the many people who contributed to this uh, uh, project. Thank you. Hey, colleagues, we are presenting the case study three sports of adult metropolitan region developing an agreement between the Federal University of Bahia, represented by Professor Susana Cavalcante and Professor Danilo Melo, and the Federal University of Minas Gerais, represented by Professor Ana Clara Moura. This is part of Brazilian case studies, in which we had the goal to develop Brazilian gel design, trees for metropolitan regions. As it was the last case study developed, we took it as an opportunity to process adjustment, to take the best practices learned from the previous workshop and apply in the workshop trees for Salvador Metropolitan Region. Salvador is located in the northeast of Brazil. It's the most important city in the northeast and the north of Brazil. It was founded in 1549, just in the beginning of Brazil, and it has always been a very important commercial port. The capital is known by its Portuguese colonial architecture and Afro-Brazilian culture. But it's also a composition of contrast from a very developed and qualified landscape to a fragile occupation represented by slums with poor condition of life. The contrast is also observed in the economic condition since the area has important industry like the Kamasari petrochemical complex. Talking about the workshop, we had general requirements from all Brazilian case studies. That was the work to increase in 30% the robust vegetation in order to contribute with, with the sequestration of carbon, with carbon credit. And we had some specific requirements proposed by the participants of the project. This is the project constructed. If we analyze it in a general sense, we can understand that from non-adopter to early adopter 2050, it was very well developed, mainly considering the current needs that were presented in reading Richmond. That was the first step, the first day of the workshop. From the current needs to the proposals, we can confirm this because the non-adopter uh, doesn't do very well, but the early adopter, considering the line from the current situation, to 2035 to 2050, it increased a lot the condition of improving the sustainable development tools. Talking about the analysis of carbon credits, we can observe an increase from zero to 30.75% 
to arrive to 30 to 85 percent of increasement from non adopter to early adopter scenario. We can also see a, a significant increase in carbon credit per person as per capita analysis. When we present the method that we use, it was the same method proposed by all the projects, but we uh, we had the opportunity to reveal some pathways in the case study of Salvador. All Brazilian case studies followed the same framework, but with local differences. The Salvador Metropolitan Region case study presented the difference of working three steps. The first step was really enrichment. We separated people not from Salvador Metropolitan Region, represented by students from the Federal University of Minas Gerais, and people from Salvador Metropolitan Region, represented by students and professors from the Federal University of Bahia and some other universities in the metropolitan area of Salvador. People not from Salvador, they did interpretations of maps and digital information from the web GIS in our platform. People from Salvador, they added additional information about local characteristics as they know, as they know better the area. As a combination of these two words, we arrived to a mosaic of interpretation, telling about vulnerabilities and potentialities. In step two, we have the proposals, the ideas. People not from Salvador Metropolitan Region presented unthinkable innovation. They were less traditional. As they don't know the area, they were more free to propose ideas. People from Salvador Metropolitan Region they thought about everyday needs. They were more traditional because they had a compromise to propose ideas to solve their daily needs. From the combination of these two words, we arrived at a mosaic of proposals from needs to possibilities, from possibilities to needs. And then we arrived to step three, that's the voting process, to decide what, where, when, and why. And as a result, we select ideas that have thematic, locational, priorities, assertiveness. And then we have the final project. It was an agreement between the Federal University of Bahia and the Federal University of Minas Gerais with the contribution of some smart graduate students and the participant of the students from both universities. We had the support of our local agencies and we use it as main software, the GIS Collab developed by the Federal University of Minas Gerais with Christian Freitas. We thank you. Hello, my name is Tiago Costa. I am a professor in Federal University of Pará in Brazil, which I am Professor Alan Nunes take part in the case study in Greece or Berlin of Pará Metropolitan Region. Part of the biggest project, Design Brazil, Greece or Metropolitan Region, coordinated for Professor Ana Clara Moran. The target of our Design case study, Berlin of Pará Metropolitan Region, is located in the middle of a dense hydrographic network about 100 kilometers of complex of most of the great Amazon rivers that we can see in that map. Important natural character is, is the largest rainforest around the cities, confused of seven municipalities and with about 1.7 million inhabitants. The metropolitan space is the second most populous urban area in the Berlin region. The design contributes to decision makers for bringing an innovative and important way to thinking, planning, and design the territory. The approach delivers a set of issues and methods necessary to solve complicated and significant problems a different geographical scale. In this respect, we conducted a work 
shop in Berlin based on his design approach. On the first day, he made a collaborative work named as Breathing Re Enrichment. This was focusing on using a GIS web based platform, just a lot, for indicating potentialities, vulnerabilities, characteristics, and needs in the two 2020 scenarios of Berlin metropolitan region. At the second day, we conducted a collaborative construction of ideas for 2035 and 2050 in a scenario of non-adopter decision makers. This was made through the two dialogues of this lab. Day three, we constructed collaboratively also ideas for 2035 and 2050 in a late adopter decision maker scenarios through the dialogues tools also. The participant had the target to increase 30% of CCO2 until 2050 using the two red gets that calculate the percentage reached number of trees and the sequestration of CO2 above the below ground. They use it the list of the assumptions. Finally, and the day four, ideas were constructed of scenarios of early adopter decision makers in 2035 and 2050 through the dialogues to the participants use it with guess to increase 30% of CCO2. They use it the list of the assumptions to and finally were conducted debates through comments and voting on the dialogues too. As a result of that collaborative work, three scenarios were built: non-adopter, late adopters, and uh, early adopter scenarios. Here, we can see the Disco Lab simulation in terms of sustainable development goals for the three scenarios. In line of that matrix, we have the list of the goals and in the columns, we have the variables of the design approach. Purple cells mean the better situation in terms of reach that goals. Orange, the worst situation and gray, the neutral situation. So we can see the difference between the three scenarios in terms of the sustainable development goals reached in 2050. Here we can see the results in terms of carbon credits. The non-adopted change very less in terms of carbon credit increment until 2050. While in the others, we can see a better scenarios on carbon credit increment. The work included the following participants. You can see in the slide to left. And in the right, you can see the institution that support the project. Thank you. We're not doing very well with questions. The only question I see posted is from me. And uh, so maybe we'll start there and it applies to all, all three uh, presenter teams. So I was super impressed with this morning's talk and, and uh, I, was, I was really captured with how hard it would be to determine in, in any kind of urban renewal project, whether you could get to either a carbon neutral or a carbon negative outcome. And so it's pretty clear from the three presentations that you have, you know, uh, more carbon sequestration. Uh, and so 
you think uh, in order to to be actually persuade people to implement such a vision that we we would need even better metrics? You know, John, the way I would respond to that is that we actually, and my colleague Tim Griffin is here, who also worked on this project with me, we actually had a hard time convincing the community that the Trillion Trees project was, was worth paying much attention to. So much of the focus is on equity and economic opportunity. And so mm -hmm. I think we have to start to frame the Trillion Trees project as an economic opportunity. For example, the idea of putting people to work, planting trees, caring for trees, um, making trees a, 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 a source of income for people. I think another way to frame it is in terms of health. Uh, we now know that there's a lot of inequities, particularly in urban areas related to heat island effects and the lack of tree canopy. And so framing the planting of trees in terms of uh, the, the health benefits, which are, are enormously expensive, uh, is another way to frame it. So I, I think we need to think about how we incentivize the planting of trees and carbon sequestration in terms of things that are meaningful to other people who may not care, unfortunately, that much about, about climate change or tree canopies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's certainly what we've, we've set out to do in Southern California here. And I, I've been studying the area where there are 57,000 residents, but we've done a, a tree census for the whole five square mile area, and mm -hmm. there's only 38,000 trees. Yeah. So more people than trees. So, right. Yeah. So, um, but our Brazilian colleagues, now, uh, how would you answer that question? You know, you've demonstrated that you'd be gaining in terms of the carbon uh, sequestration that would follow uh, plans to improve neighborhoods, but, but, it would seem from the, the, the wonderful photography in, in both talks and the vision that, you know, there are lots of, uh, there are lots of competing needs. So how, how, what would one need to do in Brazil to turn from vision to, to actually achieving the kinds of outcomes that were so ably demonstrated in the two presentations? So May I start? Make, yep. Okay. Uh, so, in the first day, we do what we call reading enrichment, in which mm -hmm. people go to the maps, analyze the area, and put pins about alerts, suggestions, problems, vulnerabilities. I didn't ask them to think about negative condition, but the negative conditions are all there in the registration yeah. of the actual situation, what we call reading enrichment. So if we need to analyze the negative conditions, they will be there in the map. Yeah. In the second day, we did non-adopter. And to non-adopter, I didn't say anything about carbon credit, anything, mm -hmm. anything. I just asked them, work as a traditional planner. You don't have to be innovative today. Just do as you know that people do. And in this day, they didn't propose anything about carbon credit because it's not our culture yet. We don't think about this. It's very new mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. The third day, I started to talk about carbon credits and the goals and we established the goal. And we said, until 2050, you must achieve 30%. So you decide how much you're going to achieve to each scenario, but there, this is a minimum. And we have a tool to control if you're doing the good, uh, if you're doing it. So uh, the neutral comes in non-adopter scenario because they didn't propose anything, the neutral. And mm -hmm. the negative comes in actual situation because they inserted alerts about the problems and vulnerabilities. But it's true that we were more positive in uh, proposing then in analyzing the negative and the neutral condition. This is true. Yes. Okay. And now, how about uh, the, the second team? Uh, what would you say about uh, the ability to actually carry a project from design to actual implementation? I know uh, Tiago and and Alan. I think are both in the audience. If one could speak to the to the question. Tiago e Alan, vocês podem falar um pouquinho sobre as condições do carbono lá em, na região de vocês, já que vocês estão na, na floresta amazônica? Yes, I will try. 
I will try. Uh, how 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 we can say uh, how we can see my English is not that good, but uh, the the Amazon region have a, a dense uh, covert of vegetation. It's really it's real in, in Berlin metropolitan region too. To, there uh, today we have a, a, a lot of trees and forests in the city. But rapidly, these forests are uh, destroyed for, for the, the growth of the city. And the, the, the biggest challenge is to convince, convince that the people that we need to preserve the, that, that forest mm -hmm. today. Uh, and just preserving the, this forest we uh, reach that uh, that uh, goes of carbon threat sequestration. It's it's important, but uh, we have uh, some some competing uh, interests because we have other uh, other interests in, in terms of uh, building uh, building uh, other building money. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. But uh, it's important to to build the the the, the idea that the forest uh, is, is important and we can do do a, a better situation and and a, a rich I, I can a, a better situation with the forest uh, alive. So. That was, that was super good. Your English is as good as mine, so we're in same shape here. Uh, so then the, the next question in the chat, uh, maybe Anna, Clara, we could start with you. And some, some people are interested in how do you coordinate between all these Brazilian studies? And were they all simultaneous? And, and was there any involvement of federal authorities in order to either uh, plan them or to execute them? It was not something planned, it was very natural. Uh, we started a very bad uh, time for pandemic here. And I decided that I should work or I would be in my mind, uh, not so well. Mm -hmm. So I started to, to invite people to work with us. We provided the data, the 40, around 40 maps to each uh, metropolitan region. Tomorrow I'll talk more about that. So we provided the maps. The maps were not so good, was an it, Thiago, because we used the official data from Brazilian platform and, and the majority of the data are not so good, but they were the data that we had. So we uh, produced the data and we feed the platform and I registered the lessons, uh, the, the, the tools, uh, how to use the tools. So I registered everything I can share the drive with you. So they, they had, uh, videos explaining what to do to, to each day. There were four day meetings and I just avoided to put all of them at the same time and at the same day of the week because we wanted to follow the development mm -hmm. and to avoid crashing the platform with so many accesses. So it was something very natural. We were passing through a di difficult time here and I started to talk to people to be together with them and they accepted to take part of the experiment. It was not. It was not something uh, different. Uh, difficult. It was very natural. Very good. I should work for you. <laughs> okay. So uh, the next question. Uh, well, there's a comment from Alan that uh, to follow up on Tom's point about the needs for trees to be more than carbon recapture and storage. Uh, Alan was thinking of other ecosystem services, uh, specifically again, those that contribute to human health uh, that could be contributed parts of an equity strategy and, and to carbon recapture. I, I think that the interesting thing we should all think about too in the context of human health is perhaps not, not, not what, what would make sense today, but, but in fact, what would make sense 10 or 15 years from now because as this morning's keynote so ably demonstrated, the world is on a path where it's getting warmer and warmer. 
and in some suburbs in Los Angeles, for example, uh, where currently we might expect in 2020 or 2021, uh, maybe, I don't know, 10, 12 days a year with 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's about 30 degrees centigrade temperatures. In some parts of the metro area, this is going to quadruple uh, in the next 15 to 20 years. And so if, if people are being asked to suffer through, you know, 10 or 12 days of extreme heat uh, with little shade and, and refuge from, from the heat, uh, then, you know, that number is going to grow four times uh, in the next 10 or 15 years. So uh, th there's a lot of big issues to, for us to work on here in terms of not just the conditions we find today, but what, what would happen, not just in terms of the trees, but to all of the things that the trees could affect going forward. So, John, uh, if I, John, could I follow yeah. on that? So, yeah. you know, I think we need a better way of calculating the costs of not doing um, these um, sort of carbon sequestration moves, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the district we were working at, the, the district is zoned for 30 story tall buildings. And the city mm -hmm. thinks, wow, that's a lot of tax revenue. Let's yeah. just let the development community build a high rise district. And we're coming in saying, well, no, we want to plant trees. And they look at us like, what are you, crazy? Um, and so, you know, what we don't have are the, the tools to make a counter argument to that kind of development to say that, you know, in fact, there are a lot of costs in not doing this. And I think that's still an area of research that we need to do. Mm -hmm. Any other comments uh, along these lines from the, anybody in the audience, Aaron? Yes, just in terms of other values that trees, planting trees and vegetation offer. Um, yeah, creating shade for more comfort. Yeah. But uh, other reasons is making places more walkable, making them more livable, which then encourages people outside moving. But also then we'll bring in lots of opportunity for economic growth, bringing in tours, getting people on the streets. Um, so in those densely zoned um, commercial districts where there's 30 story buildings, if you have uh, trees on the ground floor, you're gonna get more people there, getting them more activated. Um, another, again, benefit of trees. And, and Aaron, uh, I understand the argument you made, but uh, in thinking about Carl's book, it, it, it talks of course about the people of the place. And if you suddenly uh, sort of de develop the ambience of a neighborhood so that it has more shade and, and, and boulevards and more street life and so forth, of course, there's the, the opportunity, particularly if you, if you, if you work with an equity lens to begin with, so that you tried to help those parts of the city that had the, le the least green infrastructure, then uh, of course you run the risk now that you you, you use green to, to sponsor gentrification and uh, the, the people you were trying to help leave and are replaced by people that can afford to jack up the prices to, to, to take advantage of that ambience that we've created. Do you have yeah. any suggestions for how we cope with that in that, in that kind whoever of can solve Whoever can solve gentrification deserves a medal of honor. I mean, I, I agree. That's just the, the biggest dilemma that I that I see in this world is how do you provide amenities to people who need it without yes. alienating them? So I know, yeah. but it's a it's something we have to consider as a reality. Yeah. Thank you. Any yes, Anna. I don't, there is a question about if we are involved in distributing the message to the public yes. about the need to keep the force. Yes, we are. In these two case studies that we presented in this session, in Salvador, Professora Susana is there, but she's with her camera closed because she is with her kids. Okay. But if she is able to join us for a moment, she can confirm what I'm going to say. In Salvador, what was quite strange is that the conservation units are very small and they don't, uh, they are not installed in places with a robust vegetation. They are there to protect the beach, the coast, but not the vegetation. So Salvador, for example, uh, the students that took part in the, in the experiment were, were very worried about that because they don't have conservation units there. 
they conserve the the sand they conserve the 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 the, the, the border, but they don't conserve the, the, the robust vegetation. And also in Belém, the number and the dimension of the conservation units are not so good, is an Itiago. They have a, a, a very robust vegetation cover, but they don't have areas protected. So the students that took part in the experiment, uh, they, they understood this, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there was another question in the chat uh, that talked about uh, that not all trees are equal. And, and did anybody in their studies think about the species of trees that would be relevant to achieving the different uh, visions or outcomes that, that, that you all spoke about? So since you're on my screen, Anna, maybe you could go first. Did, did you just think about trees writ large or did you think about particular species of trees? And, 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 and for that matter, did you think about how to plant them and where to plant them? Or just did you think about them in the general sense? Annabelle, I think that was your question, correct? I think you muted. I guess if I can add a little bit more to that question is, yes. trees are an investment, but they are a mid and long-term investment. Yes. And obviously, there are lots of economic forces around a tree. And just, uh, I mean, it's a very good idea to set a certain percentage of the land to be devoted for trees. But for example, when you're dealing with a urban area or with, a, with the age of a urban area, there's, there's a lot of pressure on that land to be productive and to produce income. So I was thinking about, uh, well, what kind of, what species of trees were you planting? Were you just preserving local flora, or uh, were you thinking about productive uh, trees, maybe like orchards or uh, some kind of uh, timber-like species that could be got into production or a mix of all these? So I was wondering if you consider some of these issues on your plans. Thank you. Anna, do you want to make a first crack at that question? Well, in our case study, we have to follow the rules and uh, use the trees according to the biomes. So we, we, we respect this. Whenever we, okay. we talk about trees, we must work with the biome and uh, the, the natural trees. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Tom, wh what would you do in Minnesota? Well, uh, I mean, the native, the dominant native species here are burr oaks. We're in an oak savanna, and that's yeah. a really difficult tree to plant in urban streets. Uh, they're very large trees. And so, you know, we were more focused on the age of trees and the cycling of trees as they age in terms yeah. of carbon sequestration, recognizing that there are probably a lot of non-native species that are going to have to be used as street trees. And Tom, do you have the same challenge in, that we would have in Los Angeles when we've we, we've been working with the community to co-develop plans, and and many community members uh, don't want trees either because they the benefits arrive too late or they perceive they arrive too late, or they don't want the cost of watering them or cleaning up the leaves and maintaining them and so forth. Is that a well, yeah, and even concern? worse, we've had uh, struggles with the city because we've been redeveloping industrial areas and the city has argued, well, there weren't trees in these industrial areas, so we shouldn't plant any more trees. Uh, and we tell them you're crazy, you know, but they're actually so I mean we've had we've struggled with the city more than we have with residents around trees. Okay. That's interesting. We've had a very progressive mayor, so I don't think we've had that trouble. <laughs> yeah, we uh, do too. But um, anyway, that's more the preservation community than anything yes. else. Yeah. So uh, Chi Yun has a, a question. Uh, again, like I thought, all, all were great projects. Uh, the process of the Brazilian projects is great to increase awareness. Uh, but she was wondering uh, during the workshops, what's the, the tur turning points that people change their consideration? So Anna, you had a very nice description that you show the consequences of doing nothing. 
does it just occur organically then that people, the light bulb goes off and people say, oh, we're onto something here. This is something we should be invested in. Well, when we compare the maps of the scenarios, we see that our first day was the most important. Okay. Because we have many, 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 many points with annotations and with alerts, suggestions. And then when we arrive to the proposals, the ideas, they are not so rich as the first day. Yeah. So I may say that Brazilians uh, are very conscious about the problems. When we ask them to analyze the situation, they are very good. But when we ask them to propose something, it's not so easy because they, they don't feel secure to propose. But working one step, step by step and talking to them and putting the weed get to control, you are not doing the minimum, please think about that. They started to, to develop. So I believe, yes, uh, when we, we finished all the workshops, they were better than we, when they started, but they are still better in analyzing and criticizing than in proposing. This is true. It's kind of a transformative learning. I wrote about that. Yes. Okay. And uh, there's just a minute or so left. So has anybody got any last comments? Tom, did, in your uh, Carl, cadence? It looks like Carl has a question. Yep. All right. Carl? I, was struck, I was struck by Anna Clara's comment that her observation that many of the participants in the studies didn't even think about carbon C, couldn't, couldn't think about it. And my comment, my question was, if people in the geodesign study don't think about it, should we translate Peter's keynote lecture into Portuguese? It was a very compelling statement, or in fact, into any language. Uh, would it help? Would it help to have a compelling first introduction as part of your readings phase of a 25 minute presentation on why you should think not you should think beyond where you are even if you're in a very difficult situation it's a good point Carl so my little screen here says in 12 seconds we're going to leave the breakout room so I wanted to say thank you to the to everybody for participating